All right, I think we can get started. So welcome to the course on mobile information systems. Good morning, everyone. So um, yeah, first I think a few organizational things. Um, let's see if that works at some point. Um, yeah, who are you dealing with? My name is Florian Echtler. I'm the junior professor for mobile media. Um, I'm responsible for the lecture, of course, uh, which is why you're here right now, and for the exercise sheets. And Johannes Hartmann, uh, whom some of you may already know, will do the tutorials every uh, second Friday. If you have any specific questions, here are our email addresses. Don't hesitate to, to contact us, please. So um, the tutorials are every second Friday. They're in B11 uh, across the street. Um, we'll start this Friday at uh, half past one um, every two weeks. And this is basically the first two or three are to get you started with uh, Android development, which is wh what we're going to be using in the exercises. And um, the others are basically for uh, questions and answers once you go into the projects. So the exercises will consist of two parts. The first part will be kind of regular exercise sheets, um, just two or three to get you started, as I've said. Um, and the second half, or maybe even two thirds, will be a bit of a larger project where uh, we give you uh, each team of up to two people gets a paper, a current research paper, and we'll ask you to kind of re-implement what's described in that paper, the research idea and the research concept um, on your Android phones. So again, we, you can do the exercises in teams, but uh, only up to two people. We'd like to encourage you to do pair programming, so really to work together on one machine. Um, so you need one would need one laptop, uh, preferably, and at least one Android phone together. Um, and the grading will, of course, be half and half, so 50% from the exercises and 50% from the exam. Um, what else do we have? Of course, we have Moodle, the, the big e-learning platform, so everything related to the lecture will be in Moodle. You can either find it uh, through the uh, course catalog or you go just to course ID 650, and you will need a, a password which is not very creative, it's just MIS uh, 2016. Um, and again, I'll put everything on there, including the videos. This is the first time I'm trying this, so let's see how it uh, turns out. Um, I'll also be putting them on YouTube, uh, and uh, I'll put the link on the, um, on the, Moodle, on the Moodle site. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to use the forum. There's a message board, uh, a bulletin board, however you want to call it, in Moodle. And if you have any questions which might interest other participants in the course, please do use it. Uh, Johannes and I will be reading it regularly and we'll try to answer your questions as soon as possible. Uh, okay, so what do you need for this lecture? Um, it's a master level course, so we will assume some, uh, some knowledge on your, on your side regarding um, computer science, like a bit of programming. You should definitely know a bit of programming. For the exercises, for the lecture, you should have basic knowledge of the usual algorithms and um, maybe also a bit of networking would be helpful. Um, for the exercises, uh, you should have programming knowledge, but not specifically for Android. We'll get you started uh, in the, uh, on Friday, basically, and with the first exercise sheet, so if you don't have any Android experience, that's not a problem. Um, we strongly recommend you do the exercises with Android. In theory, there's nothing which prevents you from doing them on another platform, but we can't give you any support for that. Um, okay, so... Why Android? It's a common question. Why are we focusing on Android? There's a couple of reasons. It's the most common platform right now and it will be for the next at least two or three years maybe. Um, you can use it on any major platform. To de you can use any major platform to develop for Android. Um, it's very flexible, so you can uh, usually you have a bit more freedom than, for example, with iOS to swap out different parts and um, 
change things that are otherwise part of the operating system, and you have a very low entry barrier. So you basically don't even need uh, a physical device uh, to get started. You can use the emulator and uh, you can get a really decent Android device for 100 euros. So it's a really a very low entry barrier, which most people should be able to, to, um, yeah, to, be able to join. All right, so, uh, so now let's do a very quick poll. So who has any experience in programming at all? Okay, so let's say 60, 70%. Of those, who has programmed Java? Yeah, 50%, let's say. C++ maybe? Okay, different subset. So if you have C++, uh, C++ experience but not Java, it's very easy to make the switch. So Java is, has a very similar syntax. The, um, the classes you, you have to use are different. But if you're, for example, using Android Studio, which is the recommended development environment, then uh, you get lots of helpful hints by the IDE to, um, to make the switch pretty quickly, I guess. So anyone already has developed for a mobile device? Ah, okay, three, maybe four. The, anyone who's done networking programming? Also, maybe five, six, okay. And anyone who's done user interface design? Okay, a little more. So um, nothing of that is a, is a strict prerequisite. We will assume parts of it. So um, at some point you will have to probably uh, do a bit of, of digging on your own if, if you're lacking uh, in one of those areas. Um, user interface design, for example, isn't the focus of this course, but we will, for example, uh, look into research papers that deal with mobile user interfaces, which are quite a bit different from regular user interfaces for desktop computers. Um, so there's also a bit of that aspect here. All right, so this really doesn't work very well today. <laughs> ah. So what I'd like to talk about today is just a bit of introduction regarding how can we classify mobile devices actually, what, what ways of, of sorting them are there, what's the, the main features of the hardware and software on mobile devices, and what are the, the most central uh, features and issues we're, we're going to deal with. So um, very simple classification is of course size. Um, Biggest mobile device you probably will, will still call a mobile device is something like a laptop computer, um, which has a similar performance to, to a real uh, fixed, fixed location desktop computer, is often also extensible. Then going a bit smaller, we get into anything that's, that's handheld, like a tablet, like a mobile phone. They don't have that much capabilities relative to the, to the uh, laptop. Uh, but they are still pretty performant nowadays. Um, and because of the reduced capabilities, we often have some kind of synchronization. So we use, we, we replace local storage with network storage. Uh, so we need some kind of synchronization and we'll talk later about uh, what kind of issues you get along with that. Um, and then it's a bit difficult to classify that by size, but there's another category which is often called onboard computer, which, which is, for example, the engine control unit in a car. So this is also a computer, but it's a very specialized kind of computer that's there for uh, specifically one task and doesn't really run uh, any, any kind of general purpose tasks. Um, if we go even smaller, then we get things like uh, wearables. So for example, a smartwatch uh, would be an example. Um, where, due to the size, then we get into a, a uh, area where you only have very limited manual interaction. So for example, a few years ago, uh, when the very first smartwatches came out, I saw one which actually tried to map just the exact same interaction methods from a mobile phone on the, the smartwatch. And then you have like one inch of screen and should do like a pinch zoom on that. So it's 
probably impossible if you don't have really small fingers. Um, it wasn't, at, le at least for me, it wasn't really possible to interact with that thing at all. Um, so due to the reduced size, we now need to think about different kinds of interaction paradigms. Um, if you go even smaller, then we go into the, the realm of, of chip cards. Even those are also mobile computers in a sense. So um, usual, usually smart cards really do contain a fully programmable uh, CPU, RAM, ROM, and so on. Um, and there are uh, different different types of smart cards. For example, the SIM card in your phone, of course, is a smart card. It's a completely standalone computer which does lots of, of crypto work for the, uh, for the mobile network, for example. Um, and so for that kind of classification, it's also a mobile device. Um, and finally, uh, maybe the smallest ones in terms of pure uh, uh, device size, maybe NFC tags, which are also kind of mixed in with uh, smart cards, which are basically contactless um, devices which I can interact with without actually having to, uh, to get physical contact uh, like on the, on the smart card where I have these, these metal plates which need to make contact. So, this is a very rough classification by size. Of course, this is, uh, during the last few years, this classification is kind of, of getting a little blurry. So we have things like phablets, which are somewhere in between phones and tablets. Uh, in terms of size, we have convertibles where you can uh, switch from a laptop uh, form factor to a tablet form factor. Um, then we have stuff, for example, like the Project ERA from Google. I don't know if you've heard of it. This is a prototype for a modular smartphone where the device itself is only this kind of spine with contacts and you can slide in different modules. Uh, so your smartphone would basically become upgradable like, a, um, like a, a laptop, at least in part. So you could actually swap out the CPU and put in a bigger one or more storage or a better camera and wouldn't have to buy a new one. Yes, but please. I think LG is supposed to release something like that, like not exactly, but they're LG D5. Oh yeah, that's and right. And this camera extension, mm -hmm. this better audio So, exactly, exactly, yeah. Well, they ha I think the, the, uh, the one from LG has only one single slot where you can, can oh. swap out things, but it, it goes into the same direction, that's quite right. So the, the, the prototype from Google, you would basically able, be able to swap out everything, including the screen, um, but that still has some, uh, some issues, so it's still an research, ongoing research project. Maybe at some point in the future we'll be able to buy something like this, but not right now. And of course, uh, if you classify by size, most current smartwatches actually have a similar processor to most smartphones. They have quite a lot of processing power. They just have a smaller screen. So. Uh, you would still be able to, to run similar software, but you need to rethink the, the interaction, of course. So, as I've said, classifying by size is maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe straightforward, but it's not, not that easy, actually, to sometimes put devices into the, the correct category anymore. So, orthogonal to that, we can classify by something different, uh, namely by purpose. And there's a very rough classification. Either we have a general purpose device or we have a special purpose device. I've already mentioned an uh, example of a special purpose device, which would be uh, the engine control unit in a car. It's still a computer. It's mobile. Uh, for uh, if, you're, if you have a, a high-end uh, modern car like, I don't know, BMW or something, then they usually uh, even have several different uh, of these onboard computers. One is purely there for the engine, one is there for the, um, for the entertainment system or navigation or whatever. Um, and uh, the, again, the classification is kind of kind of getting blurry because uh, the, uh, the entertainment system, for example, in a, in a modern car is often actually running something like Android. And so it's going into the direction of general purpose device again, which has a flexible operating system where you can actually install different apps, different uh, pieces of software. Um, that's, that shouldn't probably be possible for the engine control unit. There are people who actually 
do kind of tweak their own cars and install different software, but then of course you run into all kinds of safety issues. So for the, for the general user, it shouldn't probably be possible to actually install any, um, kind, of, any kind of software on such a special purpose device. Can someone maybe think of an example for a, uh, let's say for a, a wearable special purpose device? Does anyone have an idea? Yeah? Pacemaker. Yeah, exactly. For example, pacemaker. And um, again, the, the classification is getting blurry. There are now pacemakers which have internet access. I'm not sure if that's such a good idea, maybe. Um, and of course, there are people who have already found kind of like security issues with those kinds of pacemakers. So, um, yeah. Ongoing research, but probably maybe not such a good idea per se to make that a, a turn that into kind of a general purpose device. So I wouldn't probably want to install some kind of app on my pacemaker if my if actually my life depends on it. So um, now let's see uh, if we put these different kinds of classification orthogonal to each other. So we have the purpose, and we have uh, some different categories. I've put down a couple of examples. We have, uh, for example, the, the, uh, when we look at the very bottom of the size scale, we have the uh, special purpose cards like the chip on your bank card, the SIM card, and so on. These are usually not reprogrammable, at least not from the user side. On the other hand, you can actually buy smart cards which have the same form factor and which are freely programmable uh, uh, just as you wish. So um, you can actually have your own crypto card which does uh, manage your GPG keys, for example. Um, so there's always uh, this, this um, you, in almost all cases, you have both general and special purpose devices with the exception sort of of onboard computers. So again, the navigation and entertainment unit may be different but uh, that's not often classified as an onboard computer. It's more like the engine control unit and that's, that has one specific purpose which you can't really and shouldn't really change. Um, so for the lecture, we will actually be focusing on, on a subset of the, these. Once I get this to advance the slide, which it won't. Um, so we're going to focus on general purpose devices, namely on the really mobile ones, not so much on uh, laptops, for example, and also on wearables, specifically the ones we can actually um, interact with and program. All right, to summarize, we have uh, just classified everything according to two dimensions, size and purpose. And uh, for the size, we have a very broad spectrum. So we have maybe mobile devices which are as, as small as one millimeter. And if you have a really large laptop, then it might be even up to half a meter. That's probably the upper limit of what you want to actually call mobile because you would have to carry around a, a bit of weight already. Um, but this is basically the spectrum we're dealing with. And uh, in terms of purpose, we have general and special purpose devices. Um, are there any other questions or comments up to this point? Anything unclear?